I hope everybody's well. Hey, how are you? Good for coming. Thank you for coming. I wouldn't miss this. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you doing in these pre-COVID days, post-COVID post days? Well, we're not post-COVID up here in Canada yet. Oh, you aren't? Yeah, okay. we're still, well, we're locked down right now fairly tight still until after this weekend. And then they're talking about starting to relax some of the, some of the restrictions. How are your um, vaccinations going? Good, good. I guess our ratios have surpassed the U.S.'s for oh, percentage really? of population. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, about half, half of the population of B.C., has at least had at least their first shot. I think it's a pretty well known fact that Canadians are like three times smarter than Americans anyway. So that's probably. Well, I don't know if it's smarter, but we tend to be more compliant. <laughs> we're, not, we're not quite as radical. Exactly. <laughs> I'm obtuse. Maybe it's obtuse. <laughs> I, just, I just don't understand. I really don't. Yeah, I, I, oh, people's I, resistance? Some of my family is still saying, I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get it. Yeah. Why? I just, yeah. What is their reasoning? Why aren't they going to get well, that? They don't, have, they don't have documentation that says everything is going to be okay, or maybe they're putting cancer into you and they're trying to do a cleanse, or maybe the government is, this is some sort of system for the government. And I'm thinking, yes, you're right. This global pandemic is something that our government has decided to do to clear all of you out. That just yeah. doesn't Thanks. Yeah. And not taking the vaccination is going to thwart their efforts. How? <laughs> if they want you God, you're going to be God. <laughs> right. I just, I just. Are, I like, are the ones with the, as you were saying, the one with the microchip so they can trace your movement everywhere you go. That's why they're giving the vaccine. Isn't that what this is for? Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. <laughs> it can't track us with our phones. Oh my god! Yeah. Do you know? Do you know? It's funny because I was um, talking to someone on my phone about something. I can't remember what it was, but as soon as I was through talking to them, I got on my my computer on my Facebook, and all these ads about whatever it was we were talking about mm -hmm. came up. It's like I didn't even talk to my computer. I was talking on my phone. How did that? It's amazing. It's just amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind they're listening to us. Oh, sure. Listen to me, it's not what I grant. Well, it's not people sitting there listening. It's their AI that's listening, and it's picking up on keywords, and that's what's making all of that work. <clears throat> and see, what they're, what they're envisioning is they're thinking that someone's sitting in this dark closet somewhere writing all this stuff down, listening, yeah. <laughs> because they're <laughs> just waiting on the outside to find out what you're thinking and what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And they've got time to monitor millions of people that way, too. That's a lot of dark closets that people are hiding in. <laughs> maybe this is the reason, this is a terrible thing for me to say, but maybe the reason why India is in such bad shape is because those billion people were sitting there watching the rest of the world and writing everything down, and they didn't go off and get their vaccination. So that's the reason why they're awful sick. Yeah, well, that's a logical conclusion. <laughs> That'll teach them. That's right. <laughs> I just, oh my God. I, you can't, you can't help them if they don't want to be helped, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, I know. One of my brothers, my youngest brother, he's a anti-vaxxer. 
And what is his reasoning for that? Just doesn't trust vac vaccinations just because just because every medical organization in the world is saying we need this to get past this pandemic. <clears throat> so here's an interesting question. There are a lot of a lot of parents who on a normal vaccination situation don't like to vaccinate their kids. Mm -hmm. And then when they get sick or they get their they get whatever they were supposed to be vaccinated for, mm -hmm. they're all yeah, 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 yeah. Well, should they be um, arrested or for child neglect because they didn't they didn't do what they were supposed they put their child in danger from this yeah but that, that that'll be somebody else's fault yes <clears throat> i don't see anybody coming chella uh, i should have uh I thought we were going to keep it pretty much to the writers and breaking rules. And there are a lot of authors, aren't there? There are. There are. It's very frustrating sometimes, but you're right, there are. Yeah, I'd expected this to be crowded. <laughs> I mean, I thought there'd be, with the flash fiction, there were quite a few. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because it's a long weekend and more people, well, I suppose they're not, but more people may be out traveling for the long weekend. Oh, for the Memorial Day? I, I That's have, next weekend, though. Memorial weekend is next weekend. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. Up here in Canada, it's, this is our long weekend. It's our May 2-4 weekend. Oh. Yeah. Um, well, the three of us can just talk about character. And sure. how we approach character and what we do with character. I mean, certainly can only benefit us. We're all working on novels. So. Well, then we should begin. And if someone comes along. Now let's start. So, I'll start with a few things. I, I mean, I did have an approach. Um, when I think about character, when I'm working with character, I try to brainstorm just and jot down a million things about the character, even before I get very developed in the novel. I, where was the character born? And I make up all these questions to answer myself. What are their jobs? How long they had this job? Uh, what are they afraid of? What do they like? What's their favorite music? What's their favorite movie? What do they notice? about people are, and a friend of mine who is a counselor said that one way that she approaches brainstorming, that she does Meyer, Myers Brig test on her characters to figure oh, out. Wow. <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty clever uh, yeah, approach. It probably is. You know? And, you know, the introverts, extroverts, what is the uh, and she had another approach that she uses that I don't, which is she looks up Jung's 32 archetypes and thinks, this is after she's developed more, and thinks about how various characters feel, fit into a particular archetype mode. I mean, you don't see it. It's like retelling a fairy tale. But these are the kinds of questions that begin to flood me and that I brainstorm about, even as I'm just beginning to know my character. But I thought that we could do a little bit of writing when we're talking about this and maybe start with step one, because you may have a particular character now in a novel or a short story that you're working on. And just take a few minutes and I'll keep up with it the time and describe the character, jot down specific uh, physical attributes of the character. We'll just spend two or three minutes doing this and you can just pick up a character you're beginning to develop or have developed. I'll just call time.
You need a little bit more time. I have a lot. I think I'm okay. Yeah, I'm good. So, did you learn anything about are, what kind of ca character? Is this a new ca character you're developing? I or a no. character you're already working on, Terry? Yeah, it's one that I'm already working on. But so, I've never, I've never had a solid vision in my mind of what this guy looks like. Oh gosh! It it but wasn't necessary to, to to any part of the book so far, but it but it's nice to uh, to do this, and now I see him better. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Christopher? This guy is in my first book, and I kind of take him in a couple of other books that I have, he's kind of like a reoccurring, reoccurring character. And um, when I started to write him, he was pretty, he was pretty um, clear. And as the story went along, I just started adding more and I really started to like him. Um, one of the unfortunate parts about it was that um, after I really started to like him, I realized I had to kill him off because I couldn't have him around him. Oh, too bad. <laughs> But we have to kill off people we like. Well, he was he was becoming he was becoming too much. I didn't want my stories to be focused around only him, and I was liking him to the point where I I could have written like three or four more books, and I just, right. I just didn't want it to be that much of a series. If this particular this particular thing is this it's his family, and and the, this having a series about the family is one thing. Having a series about this one guy, I didn't necessarily want to do. So he, in order for me not to, to write more about him, I just figured he needed to go. You just kill him off. That's a good way. Well, I'm working on a novel too, and um, my protagonist is a female. Um, one thing I did learn a little different today, she has a swagger in her walk, and I called it a Betty Davis swagger. Not cool. But, you know, for a lot of people, Betty Davis would be a sort of dated reference. Could you think of a maybe um, female actor that has a kind of Davis, Betty Davis swagger, but it's a little bit more contemporary? It is, it is right now? Yeah. Now or a few years back. Uh, Angelina Jolie? I would. That's a good one. That's a good one. Kind of has that spunk. That's good. Because that makes it a little bit, if it comes out somewhere, that makes it a little bit more uh, identifiable. So yeah, that, that's fun. I, I'm like, Is that's a really good question or point. Do you take a lot of your characters, either one of you, take a lot of your characters and um, and mold them after people that you've seen on the screen or in television that are famous? Do you, do you find this person say, I really like the way they are and just kind of mold your character to kind of fit their, the personality you think that they have? Okay. You want to answer first, Terry, or do you want sure. me? Yeah, sometimes I do because the type of uh, uh, person that is going to do what's happening in my story I could see them doing that on the big screen, right. like the, the movies running in my head and, and they're the person that, that uh, I would see in that. But most of the time I don't, but I have done that in the past where I've actually pictured somebody, uh, that, either somebody that I know or somebody that I'm aware of uh, being the main character. Yeah, I, when I write, I have this movie that's going on on top of my head and it can stop and go whenever I want it to. But the, those people, the, the movie is always filled with characters that I've seen in a different movie or an actor that I happen to like, and they kind of filter their way in. And some of their mannerisms or just the way they, they walk oh, whatever, and it just kind of hits them. I tend to work like Terry. I mean, I'm thinking of, I just did a little short story and it came to me that my male in the story was a lot like Adam Driver. So I had to just drop Adam's name. He's just so hot anyway. 
<laughs> and uh, but I usually have developed my characters, and it's either in process or after they're done that I begin to see them in terms of maybe something someone would recognize. But I like the way that you play the movie in your head. Mm -hmm. That keeps them very tangible and real. Yes, and very fresh. And it's, it's, I don't know why. I, David is irritated by me sometimes because I can just sit down and I can start to write the story and we can be watching television and I've got the pad and pen in my paper and there's a commercial on, so I'm writing. <laughs> and then you look up and you watch the show and then when it's done, you, you, you write because the commercial's on. And, and then you... It just can go that way. Right. Well, I worry then too, or think about it, as we all do, the kind of language that our character uses, the choice of words, um, because it's hearing them talk that also brings them alive. How, how do they respond? To, what is the language they're using to respond to others? Um, what is the language they use as they move about in the world? So I thought maybe we just take, again, two or three minutes and put our character in a particular situation that he or she is speaking. And we can hear the kind of language. Because with all of our characters, there is that I probably, I don't need necessarily mention, but well, that all of our characters have some sort of desire or yearning because it's that desire or yearning that leads to the conflict of their action. So you may even put them in a particular situation where the language itself is revealed through their language, through their action. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. So let's take two or three minutes and put words in the mouth of our character.
He need a little bit more time. So, in terms of revealing character, what did you find out or how does the language of your character further reveal him or her? Well, using certain words um, and not not uh, having proper structure in the in the sentences that they that they say. Right. That, well, tell, us a, tell us a little bit about your character so we know where you're coming from, Terry. Okay, well, the character is a 22-year-old young lady. Uh, she's very goth, so she wears a lot of... Uh, black. Yeah, uh, white makeup and, and black accents and stuff. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, so she, she didn't finish high school. So she's she's not an educated person, and I, I want that to to be reflected in her her uh, dialogue. Um, but she's she's got a good heart, which is why she's in my story. Oh yeah, okay. Do you feel comfortable sharing some of your dialogue? Sure, sure. It, it's a it's a. <laughs> it, it, it's just a, a bit of dialogue between the owner of the restaurant who's offered her a job and her um, reluctance to take the job on. Okay. So it starts off with her talking. Uh, Mike, you know, like, I don't know if I want to have a job. No. Did you mean you already have one? Like, not really a job, but like, I ain't no welfare chick. I got my pension. That's enough for you to do what you want? Sorta, of. like rent ain't no deal, and I got friends that help me here and there. Wouldn't a little job make you more comfortable? Ha! You don't even know me. There's one thing he doesn't know at this point. He's trying to hire her as a waitress. She's only got one leg. Oh gosh! <laughs> ha! You don't even know me. Like you don't know yet. Then I got to get up early, like, and be here at a time. But the trade-off is you get a paycheck each week. Plus, there's the tips. And that that's, was the part. That oh, was the part I, I got done. I mean, that's super revelation of character. Your character is quite interesting. She's goth. She's young. She's not educated. She only has one leg. It's like, man, this is. She's got stuff going on. Yeah. And she's savvy. Yeah. She is savvy. She's got street smart. She might be young, yeah. but. You know, she knows how to get around in the world without a lot. And you almost really appreciate that because so many people are just driven by so much stuff, mm -hmm. so much money. And here's someone say, hey, I got enough to get by on. I, yeah. I got friends. I got... They're just such a loving portrait. It's interesting, too, I like the way that you use her language without demeaning her. Oftentimes you'll hear how an educated quote unquote language is used almost to demean the character, but that doesn't work at all here. It's just who she is. And she's got lots of street smarts. Yeah. Because when the readers first get introduced to her, um, they're not supposed to like her. Right. But at, as they get to know her through her actions and her decisions and stuff, and she's, she's not even my main character. She's, she's only one of the extras. She is a significant character in the story, though. Then they grow to, they're going to grow to love her. Why do they not like her at the beginning? Because she, of her appearance. And her abrasion. And, and I'm, I'm basing this on my own uh, life experience because I attended a class one time, uh, and this girl was in the class and of course she sat right beside me oh. and I instantly didn't like her because she was goth and you know she had piercings and stuff like that and, and that um, but after the first day in that class I just made up my mind I was going to get to know her a little bit oh, that's great Terry. and by the end of 
of of the, the the course. I really appreciated her. In fact, the book is named for her. <laughs> really? Yeah, because her character name is Haley, and her real name is Haley, and her last name is Broadrib, and the cafe she's going to be working at is the Broadrib Cafe. Oh wow! Yeah. I love that. That's interesting. That really is good. Hey, does she? Do you still keep up with her? Mm -hmm. Do you know? Yep, I, I, I asked her permission to do this, and she said yes. She was flattered. Yeah. Wasn't she? But she said, oh, Terry, that's great. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. That, yeah, I love it. Yeah. And so, she only had one leg, too. <laughs> In real life, she, she'd lost a leg to cancer. Uh, what is that? It's a humorous story. But there's a story by Flannery O'Connor about a woman with one leg and she's always been sort of the outsider in her town and a salesman comes to town and he's just a mean spirited old guy. And I think that they're about to have sex or something. They're up in the loft of a barn and he runs off with her leg. Oh, with your prosthetic? Yeah, you might, what you might do is just Google it and see if you can find the story. This might be interesting since you're dealing with it. And you might make some silly reference or something, but since you have a character with a prosthetic leg. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, she doesn't have a, pro well, she has a prosthetic leg, but she never uses it. When she waitresses, she does it with a crutch and one leg. Oh, man. Wow. Yeah. That is, and that's just the type of girl she is. For a reason, so that she can gain more tips or attention. That's she just, that's she's good. more comfortable like that because she went for many years without a prosthetic leg because they were so expensive. And so she just got used to doing everything with that's only one leg. And, and she's now more comfortable living her life with one leg wow. than with two. How interesting is that? I love it. Well, Christopher, what did you... <laughs> My character is a 40-year-old art professor who has five sons and he's married and there's just, he has a, he had an abusive relationship. So he's kind of got lots of, of emotions going on. And so when I thought about the kind of language that he used, he's an educated man. So he speaks with some sort of education. He's very sensitive and he's parental when he talks to his kids. And yet, when, and as I was going through this, I'm thinking he has a lot of facets because he has to speak to his, his students educationally, and he has to, to, to speak to his parent, his children as a parent, and his wife, very flirty. And I mean, he just has all these different facets about him that you don't actually think about while you're writing. It's just the way he actually is. It was interesting right. to think about this. So um, the last thing I wrote was he just speaks very comfortably, so. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's good. Uh, what about the abuse, though? Does that figure... Into the story? Yeah. He was physically and emotionally and sexually abused when he was a child. So that's kind of like a component to the story. And it doesn't filter in to um, his conversations with people, just with himself. So interiorly, yes. it figures in, but he, it's not through his language or his behavior. To, that's, that's really interesting. I like that. So my character is, and this, she's educated. She's from the South. She's actually from Alabama, but she spent most of her time teaching. She was a teacher. And... Um, South Carolina. Her first husband, or her ex-husband, the love of her life, they've always been great friends, has just died, and she's feeling a lot of survivor's guilt. And it was just a, converse, a beginning conversation with her friend Susan. Why didn't I do more for him? What do you mean? Why didn't I stay with him? You had to find yourself. But without Jacob? Yes, he smothered you. No, 
I smothered myself. How? I was jealous, couldn't be in his shadow. Who could? He was so self-indulgent. No, he was a genius. Yeah. And you were chopped liver? So my language there is more in terms, I mean, it's not a dialect. I don't work with dialect. But it's more revealing her own inward kind of survivor's guilt because he's just died and she's trying to come to terms. I mean, she just talked to him on the telephone the night before he died of a heart attack. Maybe a heart attack. Maybe not. Maybe suicide. So this is interesting. I had my first book um, reviewed by a, a reader's group and one of the people right. I liked and people gave me their opinions. One guy said he didn't like it. And the reason why is because I didn't finish this particular, these sentences, because um, it was always, do you want to go with? So or did you, do you want to come with? It wasn't yeah. with me or whatever. It was, do you want to come with? And when he said that, I'm, I said, but that's the way this character speaks because he's from Michigan. And when you're in Michigan, that's the, the dialect you use. You don't finish it. It's always, do you want to come with? And he said, but that's, that was off-putting to me. And I said, so if I had written the character into Texas and said, had him say, y'all, that would have been okay. And he said, well, yeah. And I said, and the difference is what? <laughs> he said, well, y'all. And I said, be, maybe it's because you're more aware of the word y'all and it's more, right. you haven't heard people say, do you want to come with? And that makes you uncomfortable. It's not that the story is bad or that you don't understand it. It's just that you're not necessarily comfortable with that kind of language. I said, if the, the character was in England and he had a, a Cockney accent, how would you feel about that? And he said, I probably wouldn't like it. And I said, so maybe you need to stick with reading things that are in your own general area and not outside of that. Is, is that the case? And he said, maybe. So I just, it's odd that the reader on the outside is looking in and saying, I don't like the way this character speaks just because I'm not familiar with that kind of- That way. is, uh, but you know, probably a lot of readers are narrow-minded like that. I mean, the point to me when you're reading is to get in the skin of somebody else. Well, it's, I, I think that when you're writing something, if you can't, and someone's reading it, if you can't, have them do that thing in your head where you're, you're creating that story for them and they're putting themselves in right. then you failed. And this guy, as the reader, failed because he couldn't get inside where this, this person was to understand this is how he spoke. It wasn't that it was an error on my part because I didn't put the word me on the end of the on right. Part, with me. right. He didn't want to get to know this guy. Yeah, but I said it's it's a real sort of contract in the, between the writer and the reader. The, of course, the, as you were saying, the writer has responsibility for drawing in, for staying in the moment, for creating conflict and voice and everything else that we do with our character. But the reader also is a... a uh, what did Coleridge say? A willing suspense of disbelief. They enter that when they open the page, they enter the world of the writer. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, go with the writer. Yeah. That's that imaginative exploration. I'm curious just to see how many people read or leave reviews and they don't actually do that. I mean, it, I know, I think you're right. That's why I think that, writing that... groups are difficult, Chris, because oftentimes, I'm, I'm, Terry, I've been occasionally, I'm not in a lot of writing groups, but the reader, instead of entering the writer's world, want to impose their world mm -hmm. on the writer. So the critical responses are more like, do this like I would do it. Yes. And that's annoying. It's going to make their Look, it's my story. It's going to limit their choices of things to to read for one thing, and it's going to uh, make everybody sound the same. Yeah, right. And people don't sound the same, and and a lot of times that's how you can tell who's talking is because 
right the, you know the different words or the different inflections and stuff like that they'll have to start yeah. using just different fonts or italics or something yeah. so different there's, there's just the three of us here and each one of us has a different um i don't want to say accent but each one of us has a different accent to the tone of our voice right here your canadian sometimes when you're speaking you can hear that canadian tone coming through or the little words that you draw differently on. And you're the same way, Chella. You can yeah. from the south and I'm from the north. So it's totally different. It's interesting. It was just the three of us. We have three different dialects going on here. Sure. Well, we Are all understand each other. Well, of course we do. <laughs> so, so I like too when you, you know, with your character. I don't, you wouldn't necessarily know that my character was from the south because I don't. Unlike Terry, I don't work in dialect, but I do work in idioms. So, you know, like if a character says, a grandfather character says, I'm about as happy as dead pig in the sunshine. That would be a very Southern idiom. <laughs> Are there phrases that, you know, they use in different parts of the world and country that my character may use. So I'm aware of idioms and Southern idioms, but I don't use dialect much. I have difficulty with it, but you're great with it, Terry. You are. I, mean, I love it. Yours is really good. Thank you. I, I, I work on that because I, I, I like to have my characters differentiated through that because it tells, it, it reveals so much about their That's personality. It. That's it. Yeah. Dialogue, the use of words, as well as the conversations they have, should be moving the story forward, should be developing, mm -hmm. revealing the character. Yeah. And then it's interesting, too, because as uh, Christopher pointed out, when you're talking to different people, you have to change your, your way of talking so that you're right. addressing your audience in the, in the proper way. Right. So uh, you can tell what's kind of what's going on behind the, the character's mind with the way that he's talking to certain people. You know, when he's talking to an employee or when he's talking to a customer. Right. It's to, two totally different word sets, two totally different uh, tones and, and attitudes. And, and what's interesting, as I was saying before, what's interesting for my character, I didn't even put that into perspective until we just started talking about it now. It was just something that he, natu he naturally did. And I didn't, wasn't even thinking, oh, he has to be very parental at this moment, or he has to be very um, instructional because he's talking to students, or if he's flirting with his wife. It's just something that this character just naturally did. And I, I, I don't know how it well worked out for me, but that's, that's, that's how it really worked out for him. Well, let's do, let's do another, take another step because in developing character, you know, we not only think about how the character looks, how the character behaves, how the character speaks, but also how the character thinks, what the character thinks about, and what the character feels. That's the interior, the mm -hmm. internal part of the character. And you often hear this. I don't know how often you all use it in your writing. But I often use interior, and I think part of it is that many of my many of my characters are kind of isolates. You know, they're kind of hermetic. Uh, but why don't we do that? Take a few minutes and and write the internal thoughts of this particular character you're dealing with, or their internal feelings. Does that sound like a do? Sure. Yeah. I'll watch the time too.
How are you coming? Do you need any time? I'm good. How are you, Terry? Good. I could just continue writing here forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have a warm nook there to write in. I like your. Oh, yeah. It's, I got a great setup here. I'm really happy yeah. with it. So, did you learn anything in this process about your character? Any Chris or Terry or me? I don't know that I learned anything new about my character. I don't learn anything new either. I um, I can maybe I learn more about the story because I can see how I had him, how I created him, and how I had him react to people who were coming in and out of the the scene, and how he would respond to them so that he would not let on what had happened to him before. Does that make sense? Right. So one of the things, because he was abused, he didn't want people to see in him that he had had been. He was just this, wanted to be this normal guy who was going through life like everybody else does. Not that he had all these little sprinkles that were going on as he walked around inside of his head. And that was a struggle for him. Well, is that hard for his relationship with his wife? I mean, he's always kind of... It, it was, and one of the, it's, it's interesting because one of the things I, I did was try and get him to run. So he was starting to run, jog. And, but as thinking that he was going to start clearing his mind and things were gonna be away. And what happened was it just kind of made it worse because it turned into thinking more of it because it had more silent, silent inner thought time to think about all these things. And it just escalated until finally he ended up at his um, father's home in actual anger. So it just, it didn't, it didn't ju justify what- had the reverse doing. effect. It would be the opposite effect. Do you want to share any of that with us that you wrote? I don't have it with me, but I, I would have loved to, but I just, I don't have it with me. Okay. That sounds, that sounds really interesting though. How far through it are you? It's done. It was my first book. So ah. This, this particular guy, is this the one you killed off? Yeah, he's the one I killed off. He was in three three episodes and three books, and I just needed him to go just because he, I liked him. I liked him a lot. I just didn't like I just didn't want to like him so much that I kept going with him. Yeah. And to stop I needed to work on everybody else so that they could have a chance. It's kind of like having friends and you 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 pick one person that you kind of think that you like a lot and then finally realize you don't like him as much as you thought, so you move on to somebody else. Right. It's kind of that way. I didn't, I liked him, but I didn't like him as much as I thought I did. He was becoming a little sappy and I needed him to go. <laughs> and, uh, Isn't that great yeah. where you could just murder somebody like that and totally get away with it? <laughs> I didn't have to go to jail or anything. It was great. <laughs> but tell us about the interior thoughts of your character today. Did you go? You stayed with uh, what is her name? Haley. 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 You stayed with Haley, right? No, no. Actually, I switched over to my main character. Oh, okay. Because he's the one that's struggling with all these bad decisions that he's made, and one of those is that he borrowed some money, but he didn't realize that he was borrowing it from a loan shark. Oh. And so, oh, so he's yeah. just come to that realization, and so now he's. He's uh, thinking about that. So he says, cripes. Mike tosses bald up apron toward the hamper. What have I gotten myself into? How did I let this happen? Borrowing money from a loan shark. Who knows a loan shark? It was Haley's fault. She arranged all this. But I didn't ask the questions either. I was so stupid to not see that the private money was tainted money. Now they want it back and I don't have it. Are you going to send someone around to break my legs? Do they do that? Maybe I can reason with them. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Use the reasoning on them. God, how do I always get myself into these messes? Oh, my goodness. God, that is good. <coughs> it is. Is this the book that, is this the one you're writing now? Or is this the one that Patty has that she's editing? No, no, this is a different one than cool. Patty has. This one I've got through first draft. I'm going through doing the first edit on it now. Nice. 
How long does it take you usually to do a first draft? Uh, well, each each book has taken a different length of time because I've been able to devote different times to it. Um, Broadrib Cafe took, well, I probably spent about two years getting the first draft done. But the one that Patty's was editing, um, that one came off in about four months. This is, a, this is Broadrib Cafe, right? That's what this one was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gary, how do you how do you write? Do you write everything down longhand and then transfer it to a computer, or do you write this straightly to your computer? Uh, most of it I put straight into the computer, mm -hmm. but because I can I can work on multiple platforms. You know, if I, if I'm out waiting for my wife or something, I can be typing away on my phone, working on my tablet. I also have a uh, uh, a book that I can write in, and the pen records everything. Oh, cool. And it takes and transfers my handwritten notes into text. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, it's called a live scribe. Wow. Wow. And uh, yeah, it's, so, so what, whatever way I want to write, I can. It's great. I need that, I need that pen. Gee. How do, you, how do you write? I write with a pad and pen first. And then I, as I'm going, I translate. So I'm kind of like... I will write and then um, continue on. If my, maybe I've had like three chapters in and then I'll start in chapter one and start to put it into the computer and continue to write so that I'm kind of like catching myself up. But as I'm doing that, I'm kind of like um, knowing that I'm like three, three or four cha chapters ahead. I know what's happening. So I can kind of like re-edit the, the first chapter and kind of add more fluff to it and make it so that it's kind of makes sense for the next chapter that's coming along. It just, it's just easier for me to do that. I have a difficult time. Even when I write down messages or letters to whomever, I have to write it out longhand first because it's just, when I sit down at the computer, it just, it's, it's that blank screen syndrome thing. I don't know why. This could be a blank page and it doesn't bother me at all. I can write anything anytime. <laughs> when I sit down to the computer, I just have a hard time putting it all out together. It doesn't want to hit from here to there out to the keys. I don't know what that is. Do you want to share anything from your interior thoughts of your character? My particular one, he was, how he, he deals with it is just because of the abuse and letting people know. He struggles with his father and the shame and the timidity that, he's, that he has with us. And then um, he worries more about his sons and how they're making sure that they're kind of growing up like they should and remembering how his father was and and using that as an example of what not to do. So all these things are running over his head whenever he's speaking to his kids or he's speaking to um, his students, he's kind of bringing that all in. This guy was an ass to me, a real mother. And um, he has to kind of readjust and say, I can't be that way. So this was, right. this was, my, this was my guide to, to what not to do kind of thing. And, and then again, when he goes into his, his running stage, all of it, all of it just starts coming out and in his head and he's reliving it all. And in over a matter of a few months, he's just kind of like, let it all swell up. And he finally, he actually runs blindly. He doesn't know where he's going. He'll, he'll just kind of go. And every now and then he'll find himself in front of his father's house and then keep oh, going. God. Last time he ended up there and stopped and um, his father actually confronted him and it was just all out anger because and, and, his and at this, this moment in his life, his father was old and weak and wasn't able to respond. And it was just like, right. he was like attacking this old man just because he needed to get it all off of his chest and out of, out of his mind. And only until his son actually pulled, because his, his wife and older son went looking for him because he had been gone for so long. They found him and his son pulled him by the hand. And um, that kind of broke his thought and it kind of it, that was kind of the moment where he said enough of this I'm not going to do this anymore right this that was the, where my life is I need to forget that part of it the character changes amazing well I as I say I'm in the process of writing this novel so Janet who is my um main character. She's the one whose ex-husband that she was best friend, lover with all of these years, but she's also 
bisexual, but that doesn't come into this part. Anyway, this is her right after finding out about his heart attack and his death. This is some interior thought. Janet wondered how long she'd wear black and weep over Jacob, divorced almost 20 years and now reliving those hours of abandonment. Where were his warm arms wrapping around her, holding her? Their last night together, he turned to her. Why did you leave me? I love you more than life itself. I was ready to give up the ghost. Go down with a lorazepam. Then you called. That's as far as I got. These are her thoughts. Um, I'm sort of working out whether or not she's, whether or not it was a heart attack or whether or not it was suicide. But uh, it only happens in a day. So it's not going to be a novella, but she wakes up and it's the day, you know, they, they always ask the question, why this day? It's the day that Jacob, of Jacob's funeral. So, so that. Uh, it felt very real. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I could, I could imagine somebody struggling with those, with those thoughts and issues, for sure. People, this is interesting for all of us right now, because when people will ask me, how I like to write or what I write about. I, and I show, I have a book, it's called The Trade and it starts out with the World Trade Center falling down, but that's not what it's about. Right. It's about this particular family and their, what's happening to them and all the stories that go along. Something happens and they change one situation for the next. So it's the trade-off in life that I like to, to write about. So you're going along and then something happens. You get into a car accident, you lose your job, your parents right. have cancer or these things that, that mold you or change your thoughts as you're going along. And all three of us are kind of in that same thing. We're actually writing about things that are happening in real life. Not one of us is talking about someone who has a whole bunch of money or they're out there doing all this bad stuff or whatever. This is just real life situations that we're talking about that we're bringing in and affecting other people. I love that. Mm -hmm. I do too. It makes it so relatable and so human and you can read, read that and share that experience from so many positions. You know, it gives the imagination room to roam. It's a good point, Christopher. I love that. Very good point. Um, then, so we've, we've been through the physical description of our characters, uh, the kind of language, the kind of words they choose and, and the situation they're in. We've heard their internal voice. Now, what, how they perceived by another character in the story? Because often in Revelation where characters, it's not only how they interact, but it's how they're perceived. How's Haley perceived by the guy who's offering her the job? How is your character, Christopher, perceived by his father or one of his children or maybe the biological mother? How is Janet perceived by the woman she's speaking with? So I thought we could maybe take a few minutes again if you have those writing muscles going and just write a few sentences about the way another character perceives the character that we've been showing each other. Or how they react, you know, can be physical, intellectual.
How are you doing? Do you need any more time? I have to tell you the entire book to make you understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me, let me just start out with this guy. He is 40 years old. He has, he's an art professor at a community college. 
he has artwork everywhere elsewhere so that he, he's sold art so he's uh, he's good at what he does he has five sons so he has those children he has students he has one of those students who is attracted to him his father who he's estranged from and has a, all kinds of of animosity towards his father-in-law who has cancer and confides that into him his mother-in-law kind of looks at him as a plaything that they can joke back and forth this guy's name is noah elmer matthews and her name is florence gertrude i forget and so he calls her gert she calls him elmer just for one of those angst things right like a love tap in the end and then they, he has a priest that he confides in to find out that the guy the priest also has similar experiences. So he has all this trust and shared experience and uses kind of the two of them as a safe place. So there's this guy has so much going on that, you know, he feels loved and attracted by his wife and his kids think that he's a good father and a playmate and an educator. And his, his students look to him as being very trustworthy and they admire him. And this one guy who has desires him and stalks him and actually becomes a very abusive in the end. His father, who thinks of him as being a better man and father than he was and embarrassed by everything that he did and regretful of the time that he's lost with his son. And then you have his father-in-law who looks at him and, is, and admires the fact that he has all this going on and still is a, is a good parent and he has done well with his, his daughter and the mother-in-law again with the plaything and then this priest. So he's just got a lot, when I think about it, a lot going on with all these different people that are just kind of like coming through and they think of him totally differently. And this is a really good book. <laughs> what, does he realize that he's bisexual or is he gay or? Not, he's not. He was just abused. He was sexually abused when he was a child. And that's as far as it got. The person, the person David, the character David, one of his students who is gay, becomes very attracted to him and starts to stalk him and, and infiltrates himself into his family life and then later on abuse um kind of like kidnaps him and, and abuses him bringing all those those things it was when he was a kid that happened when he was a kid back up again so now he's struggling with all that all over again and then so it's just he's got a, the guy's got a lot going on i mean and, and people and people do you know you people you hear people say you know, my, my kids are doing this in school and my father has cancer and I just had, I just found out that I got to go in for something because I got, right. I mean, people have stuff going on and so does this guy. It's just sometimes it's just, it's interesting how different people are rela reacting to him in different ways because they don't know all that. All they, right. all they see right. is he's a teacher and he's really good at what he does and they, they're, the information he's given them is, is, is trustworthy and admirable. So they're looking at him that way and it's just, hmm, this is a really good, this is a really good test. Sounds great. I should read it now. <laughs> You're getting... So, Terry, how did yours go? Well, I did it uh, from the perspective of Mike, the cook or the owner of the restaurant, watching, was, ha watching this Haley. This the guy that was talking to her about, yeah. do you want this job? Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, and one of the other things that Mike has done is he's hired a mentally challenged prep cook. He did this totally by accident, but it's a, it's a really hilarious scene when it happens. So he's, that, that, that'll come up right at the end of this little piece. So Mike stood for a moment, staring out the pass-through, watching Haley as she worked. I can't believe how she gets around the way she does. I was so wrong how I first thought about her. Glad I didn't let her look shape my opinion. She's actually quite amazing. And the customers love her. At least the ones that don't try to grab her butt. She could smile more, but she's doing well just being herself. And it turns out she's kind of pretty. Who would have thought? I hardly even see those piercings anymore. And they were a big deal for me that first day. Scott never cared. Just talked with her like she was a real person. Makes me wonder who has the challenge. Wow, I love that last line. I did too. Jeez, that's great. Yeah, that's what most of the story is about, is actually the interaction between Mike and this mentally challenged fellow that he's hired. And he's so, too nice too nice a guy to just get rid of him. So he has to adapt to be able to communicate with this fella and get him to do what he needs to do. So it's Mike's revelation and Mike's change that we see to this book. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Gee. Yeah. But see, usually when you have a, the, the change in a character, they change from something bad to something better. And this, Mike is actually too nice a guy. And he ends having to find that hard side of himself to deal with the situations that require that. So he kind of goes from being good to being a little bit bad. Except he becomes more tolerant. Um, he becomes a better person. Yeah. So he's got lots of tolerance. He's got too much tolerance. He lets people walk all over him and stuff. But he doesn't, for people who are different from him, the way he reacted early on to Haley's tattoos and to her piercings. And, you know, he's very judgmental about that. Oh, so absolutely. That, yeah. So that's a kind of that's a limitation in terms. Yeah. Of, uh, well, that's true. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that one. Right. But he does change that way because he becomes more I don't know gentle with his initial reactions to people, especially ones that are different. Because he's got Scott, which is totally different from him, and he's got Haley, who is totally different from him. So does does your novel revolve around these three? When you say you're done and you're passing it on to Patty, your editor? Uh, no, not this one. I'm I'm still doing my edit. Okay. My edit. How, how long is this novel? Uh, it's about 56,000 words, so it's not that long. I don't know in pages what that is. but Yeah, so it's like a shorter novel. That's it would be yeah. more like. Yeah. yeah. It may end up a little bit longer. Because I'm I'm working in some some extra elements, and I'm not sure just how much that's going to bump up the word count. That's cool. That's cool. Um, about 113 pages. Is that 115? So yeah. that usually there's like 500 pages. Or... That's a novella. That's a novella length. Usually they consider, uh, I think. Uh, short novel from what about 180 starting at about 180 or to 200 yeah they usually say that if it's between 20 and 40 thousand words that's kind of the novella length and that anything over 40 thousand is considered a novel yeah. but you know there's a lot of different, yeah. different ways that people uh, interpret it's all that. kind of arbitrary I love yeah. novellas that sounds great. Both of your, but well, yours is done. I should read yours, Christopher. I want to show you this. Just David just brought this in the mail. This just showed up. Oh, oh cool. wow! Publishing mug. How cool is that? Yeah. Oh, that is super. So I, um, what I did was I had. Janet, who's the main character and has this survivor's guilt, I had her confronted, and this is just the thoughts of, by her good friend, Susan. Susan also was Jacob's sister, or is, was. You're hiding something, Janet. Why do you think you caused his death? The way you talk about having abandoned him, what is it? Why do you feel you have to beat yourself up? He had a heart attack. He ate all the wrong food, drank too much, never exercised. That's Jacob's fault, not yours. I drove him to it, Susan. I let him down. Mm. That's as far as I got. Mm. But that's what she's having to grapple with through this whole novel is to come to terms um, while what she perceives as not only come to terms with with his loss and accepting life without Jacob, but to what extent was she a factor in his death? And indeed, was it a suicide? There's a bit of a mystery here. Because in a small town, you know, you don't want to say, hey, yeah, my brother killed himself. So the word that gets out through his sister is that he had a heart attack. So that's sort of my approach, I, you know, is to, 
those are kind of my steps in working out character. The physical description, the language they use, their internal thoughts. Now, my taste, and I have to work with myself to get my characters out of their head. If it were me, I'd be like, you know, um, the telltale heart. Or, you know, do the Edgar Allan Poe thing, and I'd stay in my head the whole time, but I have to work against that. And then four, how they're perceived by other characters. I think that is so revealing, moving the story, showing you the character. And then I think a good exercise, if you want to do it and you're in the process of writing something, is just to tell this story that you're telling, this narrative, from another character's perspective. Mm -hmm. How would it change? What would be different? What would be the different motivations, the different yearning? Mm -hmm. It's just a way, I think, of getting more in touch with your character. I think that's a good idea. Most of the stuff that I write, it's, it's all from, like the whole book will be from one person's perspective. And so all the reader gets is other people's reactions to that individual. Right. So Keep you in largely work in third person close. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to do multiple perspectives, I think. I, and stay true to them. I yeah. Know. So there was Jackie Collins wrote a book. It's called Chances. And that was kind of like, not my first book I ever read, but one of those books that kind of changed my mind on how I wanted to write. And this particular book went from one chapter was about one, one person and the next chapter was about another person and how they related and it went on. So each chapter was jumping all around and you had to catch up with or keep track of what everyone was doing. And it just fascinated me how every, everything just works so easily. And that's, that's kind of how I write. I, I don't let anybody. So each there's not a chapter where so-and-so went to the grocery store and then the next chapter is, they came back and they went to the came home and then the next chapter is oh they decided to go to the beach. I don't, none of my books are that way. So and so went to the grocery store and so and so went to go to a dance concert and then these two people met over here at the beach. So they're they're intertwining as they go through the book. Mm -hmm. It's it's I kind of like it when each chapter is is someone else's life. Different point of view. Yeah. Well, you know, William Faulkner, one of his early novels is Ali Dying. Every chapter is told from a different point of view. So, you know, that's sort of good, but it's difficult. It's difficult. Mrs. Dalloway by Wolf, you know, she gives everybody in that book a point of view. And I'm with you, Terry. I just find it very difficult to consistently carry that through. Yeah, it might be but interesting maybe, to... Maybe if to, I had chapters in different stories, but if I'm trying to carry one narrative through... Maybe. It might be inter interesting to write from different perspectives, uh, but you kind of have overlapping events. So this person right. goes to the store and then goes home, and but this person was at the store and saw them come in, and then they do their own thing afterwards. Exactly. And, and you get... Right. You get that way you get two different perspectives on the same event. But the, the second time you're taking the reader through it, they already know what happened. But it, and so then the, 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 the key element would be what that second person saw that was different from what the first person saw. Exactly. Yes, yes, excellent. Now, is that what happens in your novels, Chris? It is, it kind of is. Um, each chapter that I write, um, Starts, it starts with one of the, one of the, cause there's a, I, I tend to use a lot of characters just because right. people, people have friends. So mm -hmm. I like to intertwine their lives together. So when this particular family, this, this bless me father, this particular family, I got lucky because he's married. He, so he has his wife, he has five sons that are kind of like teenage and younger. And then he has his father that he doesn't want to deal with anything with and his, his parents for his mother-in-law and father-in-law and then sister-in-law. And then he has a priest and then he has all the students that he has. So he has a lot of people that he's interacting with. And, and as he's coming in, a good point is he's, there was one point where he would, 
before about his art class that he was teaching. And it was told from one of the artists' perspective and how he was coming in and how he yeah. was in class. And Good. he thought about what everyone was doing and going on. So I, I like that. I, I even wrote one, one of the, in, in, a, a later in the book, later in a couple of books let down the road, one of my characters was the house that, the, that they had lived in. It was an old barn. Oh, old yeah. Barn. And I decided that That's this- That's kind of what you're doing with doors, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. So this particular house, someone caught it on fire. So you hear and feel what the house has to say, all the memories that the house has. And the right. paint's funk melting down the, the wall and how that's kind of like crying and the window, windows that are popping out and the smoke going through. It's just the house has its own character because they're in it all the time. Right. That sounds it's fabulous. Part of the, it's part of the story. So when, that's, when the house burns, it has to have its own character moment or chapter too. That was kind of fun to write. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I sent out a handout for us, and did you get it, Chris? It was. You want me to send it to Terry real fast? Yeah, send it to Terry. I, you know, we, you can re read this on your own. You've probably read these anyway, but I sent two short Kate Chopin stories, The Storm and The Story of an Hour. And the story of an hour is a very interior kind of story. There are external events, but if you haven't read it, I'm I'm not going to give any uh, anything away in it, any spoilers. But then hills like white elephants, probably you've all read. The thing is, I like about hills like white elephants, and this is what I like about the the short work that. Hemingway does, as well as Kate Chopin, so good with dialogue, you know, and dialogue is so essential to revealing character, mm -hmm. I have removing it ahead, and you don't want, you know, people say, oh, it should sound like conversation. No, you really don't want it to sound like conversation. We have a lot of dead words and and words we don't need. You want to be concise and condensed, but it does give the illusion of conversation. It's like, do you want to go with? Like Chris was saying, you don't feel that. I, would you like to go with me to the grocery store? Mm -hmm. No. Wanna want to go with? Or, you know. You coming? Yeah. yeah we yeah. speak in fragments. We don't yeah. speak like our English teacher in this eighth grade. So I wonder, um, now that I've read both of your books, I, as you're going through and, and any other work that you've done, I wonder, <clears throat> because I like to write in my dialogue, I'll write the dialogue out like we're talking now. And then after my, my, my quotations, as I sit in the chair looking into the, the computer screen, I add that into the into the into the dialogue so that people can know what I'm doing, as opposed to stopping there and adding another paragraph or something behind. I'm kind of telling what this, the person's doing or thinking as they're talking. Do you guys do that often? Yeah, I usually work the thoughts and stuff in with the words. Uh, you know, because quite often somebody will start saying something, but then they. They remember something about this person. Oh, I can't say that. And they got to change their yes. their sentence mid sentence. Well, you got to have a way to explain that to the to the reader so uh, that they understand the how the thought processes are working and such. Is it Trevor Nunn that does the free, so much of the free indirect style, and that you'll be listening to conversation and suddenly it just morphs and to the narrators or to the character's interior thoughts. That sort of sounds like what you all are doing. Mm -hmm. A movement from interior thoughts to uh, dialogue and back. I just like to connect. I don't, I don't like when I write or even when I read something that is, that is saying, he said, she said, right. he said, yeah. I want blah, blah, blah. And, you're, and Noah, or, or this particular character, Noah replied, blah, 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 as he sat in a chair looking out over the, the ocean. 
You know, I like, I like to, to say, this is what he said, this is what he's doing at the same time. Or, or thinking with regret or, or whatever. I just, it, it makes me feel like you're giving more to the story or the character or the reader than what they're actually thinking they're getting. Well, you're including the body language into it, which can, uh, it, which can reshape the words that the person just spoke because maybe they're being sarcastic and stuff. But I, who wants to say he said sarcastically, right? I'd never say that. <laughs> I'm going to show you exactly. his actions that, and then the reader goes, oh, he doesn't really mean that. He's being right. sarcastic. Yeah, absolutely. We, we just have to be careful that you don't lose the reader in terms of who's speaking. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't like a lot of tags either. I just want to be sure the reader knows yeah. who's speaking. You would be yeah. surprised how many how many submissions that we get where you're you're going along and the the conversation is going back and forth and you're lost who's saying what because they don't identify and they're so they're so caught up in Jane said this blah yeah. blah 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 and then continues to talk or or this conversation that we're having here if we didn't know who we were or who was talking, or the level right. who was speaking. All of that is just put in there with no indication of who's talking at all. And it's yeah. so confusing that I'm sending it back, you gotta fix this, I can't, I can't do that. Yeah. And I, it can be so so easy to reground your readers. Yeah. Right. You, you, you know, um, yes, I agree with you. Bill tapped his head. Well, now you've regrounded your reader without saying that Bill said that, but they know that yeah. Bill said that. exactly, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I agree. So what else do you have do we have to add? I mean that's kind of was my approach with the four points and the three handouts. I think this was cool. It was very thought provoking. I mean I I you know I write the characters and I write the books and I go along and I never really I never really consider what you do because you write it all out this is who this guy is and whatever I just write it and now that I actually have to think about it he's kind of a cool guy I'm sorry I can't yeah. well, <laughs> what it might do Christopher you know in the process of writing you may not think about but now that you're thinking about it before you write it it might already be there and so when you start writing oh, yeah. mm-hmm I thought this was a great, great exercise today. I agree. Um, you guys I've already agree. kind of do a lot of this stuff, but seeing just uh, doing it practically, doing it for a purpose, I, I, I like that. I'm going to do this more mm -hmm. when I'm er early developing my characters. I think so. And you know, isn't it easier to work with a few other people than to do it alone? I was, one of my questions I was going to ask you guys, if you ever, if you've done that, if you've taken part of your story and given it to someone to read if, and, as you continue on so they can see how you're doing or what their thoughts about it are, have you ever shared your stories with anybody? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do that all the time. Do you? Chella, do you? Mm, the only person I share mine with is my husband and he's a writer. I don't, and this is my reasoning. I just don't, until I really get my story and am comfortable with my story and confident with my story, I don't want to get input from other people. I mean, so maybe they don't like, the, you know, and it goes back to what I was saying, how some readers want to impose the way they would do it on your story. And until I'm really solid with my story, I don't want to hear any responses except for Ted's. And he's a very good fiction. He's a very good editor. So I feel comfortable. He'll say, what in the hell does that mean? What is that doing for me? And he can say all sorts of shit to me. And it's, I know that it's to strengthen that story and make it better. So one of the books that I wrote is called Wild Swan. And I actually had a Facebook group of about eight to 10 people come in and I said, I'm gonna write the chapters and I'm gonna send them to you and you can read them and then you can send me your responses back. And if you think that should be changed, you can give me some suggestions and I'll do it that way. So we did that through the entire book. It was um, a lot of fun in that way because you had 10 different people interpreting your story. Right. And I connected all. 
but it took me out of my comfort zone because I'm very protective. I don't want anyone to see it until it's done. And right. Particularly one was like, all right, I'm, I'm giving you this. This is where we are. And it was cool. It was kind of fun to play with them. You know, I yes. can see maybe some stories or if you start with that, that would be an interesting project. But if you really have a story that you know you want to tell and kind of how you want to tell it, well, I may, you know. Yeah, I'm always anxious to to get other people's opinions, particularly on my novels. On my short stories, I'm, I usually won't send them out to anybody until they're finished. But on the novels, do up the first chapter, send it out and see what the reaction is. I've got probably four or five novels that I started and the reaction was deadpan cold. So I thought, well, I guess I just got a lousy idea. Oh, wow. <laughs> so well, I, I mean, stopped and went on to something else. Maybe you should just... Karen? Or send them Sorry? Go ahead, Chris. Maybe you should risk rework them or send them to someone else and see what they think. Yeah, possibly. I've got enough I'm working on right now. <laughs> <laughs> See, I just would not, unless it's, I won't say I'd never do that. I'd say never. I'd probably do it tomorrow. But um, I don't know. I just, some ideas I like and I want to write. I got a story there and I know other people wouldn't particularly like it. So I want to get it done. I mean, I probably just don't have the courage that you do, Terry. So have either of you seen, I'm sure you have, the movie The Way We Were? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he, Robert Redford is the writer and she read his book and they're discussing it and she's telling him how she loves it and whatever and his response was, what didn't you like? Mm -hmm. First thing he said was, what didn't you like? I found that interesting. What didn't you like? Yeah, it's kind, it's kind of what I asked. Approach. I asked my readers, I said, what parts? Um were hard to read because uh, right? if you've got a, a chapter or a scene or something that drags, you want to identify that so you can either cut it or spruce it up. Not what you didn't like, but what did you find hard to read? That's different. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, great. I'm sorry more people didn't show up, but you all are great writers. Yeah, to talk to. Fun, so this was good. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for for uh, hosting this. Oh yeah, well, Christopher hosted it, and we talked. Yeah, but you about came it. and you get, and you lent us your expertise. Let's make a Zoom meeting. That's all I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're still going to do the dialogue, aren't we? Yeah. And I'll probably use that hills like wide elephants again. I don't know about the other two, but I think that's great on dialogue, and. Particularly, it's like Ray Carver's, what we talk about when we talk about love, they never talk about it. Then in Hills Like White Elephant, that's it again, that everything is really in the subtext. Everything they're talking about is not what they're really talking about. It's great dialogue, I think. All of his short pieces are great dialogue. Well, guys, this has been fun. Yeah, have a great day. Thank yep. you so much. Take care. Let's do this stuff again. I think okay. I love these sessions. I do. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.